My name is Alan White, and I'm the Dean of Thomas Harriet College of Arts and Sciences here at East Carolina University. On behalf of Harriet College and its generous supporters, we're pleased to welcome you to the beginning of the fourth season of the Voyages of Discovery Lecture Series. We opened the 2010-2011 series with the Lawrence F. Brewster Lecture in History, co-sponsored by the History de uh, Department in the college. Launched in 2007, the Voyages of Discovery Lecture Series advances the spirit of exploration and discovery that's the hallmark of the liberal arts. The series honors the rich intellectual life of Thomas Harriet, an English Renaissance man whose remarkable and diverse accomplishments in the arts and sciences are a model for our own voyages of discovery. Throughout the academic year, Harriet College partners with members of its Advancement Council and other generous supporters to offer a program of distinguished professors whose pioneering work in their many fields continues to shape our appreciation and understanding of the world around us. We're proud to offer a diverse group of distinguished speakers for the 2010-11 season, which includes four lectures this year addressing topics that range from slavery during the Ottoman Empire to the origins of the universe, from the reinvention of Christianity to the history of an exceptionally popular outdoor dramatic production about the lost colony of Roanoke Island. With a fine slate of lectures such as these, the Voyages of Discovery uh, lecture series well retains the standing as the premier intellectual event for Eastern North Carolina. This evening, we're honored to have uh, Dr. Eve M. Trout Powell, Associate Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania, as the presenter of the Lawrence F. Brewster Lecture in History. Immediately following this evening's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to participate in a question and, question and answer uh, session with Dr. Trout Powell. I'll now turn the podium over to Dr. Jerry Prokopovich, Chair of the Harriet College Department of History, who will introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you. The Department of History is delighted to present this year's lecture and a continuing partnership with the Harriet College of Arts and Sciences Voyage of Voyages of Discovery lecture series. Over the past three years, the Voyages of Discovery lectures have invigorated the intellectual climate on our campus. I'd like for us to take a moment to thank the director of that series, the History Department's own Professor John Tucker, standing in the back of the hall. Thank you, John. The goals of the Brewster Lectures in History are to provide an opportunity for students, faculty, and community members to hear from distinguished historians, to stimulate exchanges of ideas on important issues, to illuminate the present through the prism of the past, and to reinforce the continuing importance of history as a vital component of a liberal arts education. This evening's lecture will, I am sure, meet all of those goals. Human slavery, is both an historical topic from ancient Greece to the antebellum south and a contemporary global issue from the Sudan to South Asia. The question of how language not only describes events and institutions, but shapes and influences our perceptions and memories is central to modern historical inquiry. We are honored to have as our speaker someone with expertise in all these areas, Dr. Eve Trout Powell. Dr. Trout Powell is an Associate Professor of History in Middle East and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She holds multiple degrees, including her doctorate from Harvard University, and taught for 10 years at the University of Georgia before moving to Penn. She has held numerous fellowships, including one from the MacArthur Foundation. Her first book, A Different Shade of Colonialism, Egypt, Great Britain, and the Mastery of Sudan, reflects her scholarly interest in Africa and the Middle East as does her current research and her topic this evening, which is the language of slavery, the diction of freedom, voices from the Nile Valley and Ottoman Empire. Please welcome Dr. Eve M. Trout Powell. I'd like to thank um, Dean White and Professor Prokopovich and um, Professor Tucker 
and particularly my colleague and friend, Professor Mona Russell, um, whose work I didn't tell her I have assigned to my graduate seminar this fall. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I can't see you very well, um, so forgive me if I'm kind of blinking a little bit, but I can see the paper. And um, yes, this project, what I'm gonna um, um, share with you this evening, am I lifting? No, the energy is getting reverb. Okay, all right. Anyway, um, I have a new title for my book, and the book is called um, "Tell This in My Memory," and it's narratives of enslavement in the late Ottoman Empire, um, Egypt, and Sudan, and um, and it is about the language, the diction of slavery, and the language of freedom. But this particular chapter that I'm going to share with you tonight is actually called "Hoda Halliday and the Slaves at Bedtime." And so here are the two women about whom I will be uh, focusing this evening, Hoda Sha'arawi and Halide Adib Adivar, and I will introduce them to you rather gradually. I'd like to start with a uh, quote, and this is Hoda's self-described nightmare that she wrote about, and I will read it to you. I used to imagine that I was not my mother's daughter, that my real mother was a slave girl who had died and the truth was being withheld from me. Firmly convinced of this, I suffered all the more. I could keep everything suppressed until nightfall, but as soon as I laid my head on the pillow, I was overcome by anxieties and frightening thoughts moved me to tears. Now I'll read you another quote. I do not have a, a slide for this. This is from Halide Adib Adivar, also written by in, years later in her memoirs about her childhood. Halide describes herself in this third person, and, and I quote, the woman whom she called mother is lying in semi-darkness beside her in a large bed clad in her white gown. There are those long, silky plates which seem to coil with the life of some mysterious coiling animal, and that small, pale face with its unusually long, curly black lashes resting on the sickly pallor of the drawn cheeks. This mother is a thing of mystery and uneasiness to the little girl. She is afraid of her. She is drawn to her. And yet that thing called affection has not taken shape in her heart. There is only a painful sense of dependence on this mother who is quietly fading out of the background of her life. By the time Hoda Sha'arawi described how haunted she had been as a child by the idea that her imagined slave mother had died, she was a powerful figure in the Egyptian nationalist movement, a middle-aged woman with her own grown children and an internationally recognized leader of the women's rights movement in Egypt. Her strong political and nationalist voice made her a figure that for decades dominated articles in the Egyptian press. A slide, a pretty um, famous slide of the 1919 Egyptian revolution for independence from the British Empire. And it's notable that these are women who are sort of leading the charge, um, upper class women, and, and you can tell that from their veils. And Hoda Sha'arawi, although she was not out in the streets like this, was one of the leaders of this revolution. By the time Haride Adivar wrote down her memories of her sickly mother, whose chronic illnesses left her daughter to be nursed by slave wet nurses, she too was a powerful figure in the Turkish nationalist movement that would eventually um, and successfully replace the Ottoman government after World War I. And there, is, um, there she is with some of the late um, last leaders of the Ottoman Empire during World War I. When she wrote her memoirs in 1926, Halide was a self-exiled, twice-married mother of three, a best-selling novelist who had been an activist spokesperson for the Young Turk Revolution, for the Young Turk Movement, and who would eventually become a member of the Turkish parliament. Both of these women were born into highly privileged families during a period in the late 19th century in which massive political and cultural change would alter the traditions that shaped women's education, marriages, and public lives. Slaves were an integral part, an integral and intimate part of their childhoods and the many vivid experiences that both Halide and Hoda remembered about the slaves with whom they had grown up shaped their vision of what maturity and independence should mean for themselves and the women of their country. <laughs> 
Hoda Sharawi <clears throat> was famous enough by the 1920s that photographs, even caricatures of her image were published in many newspapers. As Beth Barron has shown, increasingly vocal and politicized Egyptian women leaders struggled with the control of their images in the press. Hoda was arguably the most famous and visible of all of these women. Given the sensitivity to slavery that she later revealed in her memoirs, it is interesting to see Hoda caricatured in the following way, in the popular political magazine El Kashkul, which means the notebook in Arabic. So the cartoon, I couldn't fit the cartoon, the, the caption uh, on, the, on the slide, but this is a beautiful um, watercolored um, illustrated um, journal. And underneath this image, this rather striking image, um, the cartoon is called in Arabic, Where is Independence? And it refers to a fraught political confrontation over Egypt's nominal independence between uh, uh, Egypt's nominal independence and the British. The caption, which is right at her feet, all right, <clears throat> begins with the, the African figure or the dark skinned figure whose name is El Bash Aga, beginning with his asking her in colloquial Egyptian Arabic, my lady, if there is no independence for these nationalist men, what will they do? And Hoda answers, listen, O Bash Aga, as long as there is a nation that wants independence, don't be afraid. You're more of a man than all of them. Now the joke here, the, her, the audience was in 1926 would have gotten the joke. I see that it just went on over, but I'll, I'll, I'll give background. The, the, the joke here, as El Kashkul's readers would have immediately understood from the name Aga and from this caricature of a Sudanese figure, is that he was a eunuch who had been a slave in the household in which Hoda Shad Ali had grown up. Beth Barron, a very um, significant historian of Egyptian women's history, has pointed out, has pointed us towards the emasculating irony with which the caricatured Hoda states that this eunuch is more of a man than the leading politicians of the Egypt's biggest nationalist party. But the picture reveals another, perhaps less intentional irony as well. Under the title, Where is Independence, stands a remarkably outspoken Egyptian woman with a slave who had been part of her household since childhood, who had, as this chapter will discuss in more depth, helped raise Hoda since her babyhood and stood with her, was satirized alongside her as she uh, well into her adulthood. His real name was Said, Said Aga, as she called him in her memoirs. Said Aga played a pivotal role in her observations about slavery in Egyptian society, yet remained with her as she matured into a national political figure. We can assume that his role in her life changed after her marriage, after the births of her children, but his connection to her household did not. So how does this slave, this companion, accompany the dramatic trajectory of this groundbreaking woman's life? Could he do so independently? How did this leader of the Egyptian nationalist women's movement negotiate the distance between childhood nightmares of a mother's enslavement and the constant loyal service of a slave her entire life? Although by the turn of the century, Egypt and the wider Ottoman Empire were no longer as united politically or economically as they had been a century before, the domestic cultures of the two regions were deeply connected and in massive flux. As they moved up the socioeconomic ladder of opportunities created by the secular schools and institutions of Muhammad Ali, who had ruled Egypt from 1805 to 1840, uh, 1848, a generation of men, like Hoda Sharawi's father, often chose to marry Ottoman women or Turkish-speaking women or to purchase Circassian women as concubines, a practice they shared with their Turkish-speaking elite counterparts in cities like Istanbul. In the late 19th century, when the children of these unions were born, this upper-class Ottoman Egyptian household, one of the most important social formations, unraveled. Harem slavery, that idea of the slaves all in one part of these elite households, harem slavery dwindled dramatically, in part due to the consequences of abolition, but arguably due also to the rise of nationalism and the powerful idea that, as Beth Barron writes, foreign-born slave mothers could not be entrusted with raising good patriots. And here's Beth's description of this unraveling. The new nation could not be built on households that included harem slaves from the Caucasus, retainers from Central Asia, concubines from Ethiopia, eunuchs from Africa, and patriarchs from Anatolia or the Balkans. 
the Circassian slaves and their descendants would be absorbed into the new elite, and the new nation would be constructed around bourgeois families, Muslim, Copt, and Jewish, grounded in Egyptian territory. The transition from empire to nation state was reflected in the micro level as, as well as large multi-ethnic households were reconstituted as models for the nation. So as men like Muhammad Sultan Pasha, Hoda Shadawi's father, merged with the Ottoman Egyptian elite through marriage and concubinage, Ottoman Egyptians also merged with a changing Egyptian political landscape where leaders spoke eloquently of Egypt for the Egyptians I hope that you hear in that quote that I just read by Beth Barron, I hope you're getting a sense from the quotes that I read by Hoda and Halide and from the picture um, that I, I'm showing in this slide, that slavery in Egyptian society at this time was multiracial and multiethnic. That you do not automatically have the kind of racial divide of dark skin means uh, um, slave inheritance or slave legacy because very fair-skinned people from the Caucasus near Russian territory or, or even from the Balkans also had lived for many generations as slaves in this culture and were still being uh, sold as slaves as I will show further. So I just hope a picture is beginning to become a little bit clear of the incredible multiraciality of slavery in these societies at this, at this time. So Hoda Sharawi was thus not only the daughter of an immensely privileged family, but also a figure who bridged this very transition from the multi-ethnic Ottoman Egyptian household to bourgeois monogamous uh, families. Although the politically and historical significance of the transition of the Egyptian family is clearly shown by Beth Barron's careful research and analysis, this transition is difficult, often polarizing, and was always deeply felt. Nor was it always cut and dry, as the cash cool character of Hoda Sharawi shows. This symbol of the activist and modern Egyptian woman could never quite escape her close connection to slavery. In many ways, this transition also occurred in the late Ottoman Empire, where a growing politicized awareness of Turkish identity also studied carefully the position of women and marriage in the family. Halide, too, like Hoda, stood directly on top of this cultural fault line and wrote about it, as you will see. Both women share childhoods greatly structured by slaves and the rituals of the slave trade. Both Hoda and Halide grew up uh, where at their birthdays or on marriages of other relatives, slaves would be given as presents. Both Hoda and Halide grew up in environments where the presence and work of slaves was as elemental and as comfortable as furniture. The work and presence of slaves helped to define and articulate these elites' sense of home, not only in its physical structure, but also the traditions of family structure that bound Circassian servants and Sudanese servants or slaves to them. But it is important to note that different from the men I describe in my book, male slave owners either from the Sudan or Egypt or from Istanbul, as women, Hoda Sharawi and Haride Adid internalized this relationship with slavery very differently. They were connected to a very broad network of slaves and felt that they possibly might be related to it. So one of the people I write about, a very famous educator in Khartoum, would write constantly about how his family went 10 centuries back in Sudanese history and there was no slave to be found among them. And he would go back deeply into his genealogy. This was not the case for Hoda Sharawi, whose household as a child was made up of slaves and servants, and whose mother, it m may very well have been a slave. Nor was it similar to Halide's upbringing, and as we shall see, her constant vigilance against being told that she looked like a slave or that her personality came from blood ties to slaves. Hoda's memoirs are a fascinating account of her struggle against the constraints of her childhood and her protest against the premises upon which Egyptian upper class households were both structured and idealized in the late 19th century. She was a careful observer of her society and acutely aware of the limitations facing Egyptian and Ottoman women. She followed closely debates about the status of women in Egyptian society and in turn of the century Egypt, this debate often equated the circumstances of women with those of slaves. <laughs> 
So this chapter is going to explore these debates. Actually, it's really just going to explore what Hoda and Halliday said about it, because I don't want to read you the whole chapter, because I want you to stay awake. So this part of it is called, Was My Real Mother a Slave? Um, as we have seen above, Hoda was haunted by the fantasy that she was not the daughter of the mother she knew, but of a slave girl who had died. What circumstances could have frightened this privileged little girl into such a sad dream? In 1879, when Hoda, Hoda was born into the wealthiest strata of Egyptian society, and consequently into a social network in which Circassian slave women were often concubines, wives, and mothers to very affluent children. These parts of Egyptian society were intimately connected to the elites of Ottoman society. As Ehud Toledano has written about Cairo and Istanbul in the mid-19th century, members of the prominent households in both cities were linked to one another by family relations or through social networking. The children of these communities, especially those born in the same years as Hoda, shared many connections of ethnicity through genealogical inheritances from Ottoman, Circassian, and Sudanese slavery. Here is Beth Barron again describing the backgrounds of Hoda's um, female political contemporaries. Hoda's mother was Circassian. Munira Thabit's mother was Turkish. Fatma, this is a famous actress who became a politician's parents were Syrian, and Esther Wieses were Copts. Their own family backgrounds and political trajectories show the transition from Ottoman households with slaves and ex-slaves to Egyptian families. Hoda's mother was a concubine and a Sudanese eunuch presided over the harem. Esther grew up in a household run by a Sudanese ex-slave, daughter of a chieftain. So a generation earlier than Hoda, thousands of young women the age of Hoda's mother were brought from the regions of the Caucasus to the largest cities of the Ottoman Empire as slaves to be sold, as refugees and then often became slaves. If these young women were fortunate enough to be sold to wealthy families, they stood the chance to be educated and well-maintained. If they bore children to their masters slash husbands, their position was enhanced legally and they could be manumitted and gain rights towards inheritance. Their lives in the harem, rooms in the household where they were segregated from unrelated men, intrigued Western travelers and readers of the 19th century who romanticized the daily lives of these white Circassian women much more than they did the drudgery of African slaves working often in the same chambers. But there was often very little romance to the challenges faced by all of these women in a time when they could exert very little control over their sexual and reproductive lives. Ehud Toledano has unearthed documents that describe the sadness of many of these teenagers' experiences. He explored the difficulties that such women, such young slave women had in controlling their physical circumstances. And I'm not gonna take you through the whole journey through one girl that, that he does because I wanna relate it to Hoda's mother, but I'll summarize the story of a young woman who in the 1830s and 40s named Shen Tsigul was actually sold, she was Circassian and was sold to an Egyptian slave dealer who impregnated her and then her baby was forcibly taken from her and she actually tried to get the baby back and it's a very sad, she loses the child to the wife of the slave master and, and it's a very sad story that sort of emblematizes this complete loss of control of, of, of reproductive freedom. Now Hoda Sharawi's mother, whose name was Iqbal, would have understood this kind of sadness in fact, as Hoda wrote, her mother confronted sorrow and depression through much of her adult life. She too was forced to make a difficult and traumatizing trek from the Caucasus to Egypt during her adolescence. The decade between 1854 to 1864 marked a period of political terror and economic disaster for many of the ethnic groups of the Caucasus where Iqbal was born. This vastly multi-ethnic region had long been, as we know, a major provider of slaves for the Ottoman Empire. And as Leobov Derlugian writes, the Caucasus was the world-renowned source of male and female slaves employed for concubinage and sexual services. Hoda Shadawi's mother came from a politically important family in the Caucasus, so would undoubtedly have been familiar with a world in which economically slaves were also a universal measure of exchange. So this became, as the Russian Empire encroached on the Caucasus and began to try, in the name of expansionism and also in the name of abolition, began to try to push out Muslim 
tribes in the Caucasus, places like and I, I like Chechnya, Ishgut, um, 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 the names are escaping me right, Ingut Ingushetia, places that have been in the news lately, um, fighting against Moscow's dominance over these regions, were some of the places from which these Cauc these these refugees from the Caucasus came. I'm not going to say Caucasian because I want us to be careful about our racial terminology here. But these are the places from which they came. And as the Russian armies uh, intruded on these areas, many of these groups, these communities, these tribes began to fight against each other. Often they fought against the Russians. Iqbal's family got caught up in this, and this was what caused so many thousands of people to flee and caused an exodus of refugees into the Ottoman Empire. These origins were very important for Hoda to understand, but yet she remained, Iqbal herself never told Hoda of her origins. What we know of Iqbal's journey came to Hoda from her maternal uncle, from Iqbal's brother Yusuf, who told her of the war that had erupted between Russia and the Caucasus in 1860, in which he and their grandfather had been taken prisoner, and Many members of the family were eventually killed. They continued to rebel against the Russians. They rebelled against other Caucasian armies. And finally, finally, um, Iqbal's mother, having lost two children, decided to get the, her remaining offspring out. All right? And they fled to the Ottoman Empire. And there, the grandmother arranged to have Iqbal go to Egypt to live with her uncle. The family entrusted Iqbal's delivery to her uncle to a friend on his way to Egypt, but when the pair arrived in Cairo, they discovered that the uncle was fighting in the Sudan, and the uncle's wife refused to claim any connection to this young Circassian refugee. Iqbal, a beautiful young and unmarried woman, was placed in the household of another elite officer to wait for her uncle's arrival. Her presence there also began to create trouble. Here she was, unattached, and um, finally it was good that, as Hoda wrote, my father chose her to be his wife. But there is actually no proof that Muhammad Sultan Pasha, Hoda's father, married Iqbal. And most historians of Hoda's life consider Iqbal to have been his concubine, a status that often meant that the woman had been purchased. Hoda's memoirs contain many details about the difficult passage of her Circassian relatives from the Caucasus, but none about the possibility that her own mother had been sold to her father in Cairo. Instead, she paints a picture of a husband doting on his melancholy wife. This is a long quote. I'll read it slowly, but bear with me, okay, and listen for some of the clues. One day, she, Iqbal, was helping my father put on his clothes, and it just so happened that she was standing by the window, looking out in the park, and be she began to weep. My father asked her what caused her to cry. She responded that among the visitors waiting in the reception room, there was one who resembled her brother Yusuf, and she couldn't keep herself from crying. Hoda's father asked her about her family and kinsfolk. When she told him her story, he sent right away to the household of Ali Bey Ragab, where Iqbal had first stayed when she first arrived in Cairo to get the address of her family. And fortunately, there were relatives present in the, uh, fortunately there were relatives present in Cairo. My father prepared the funds to have them arrive. He brought them. This meeting was a great joy and deeply affected my mother, who moved into the first house in his compound. Hoda's uncle Yusuf and other relatives soon followed, and my mother returned again to her family and her relations. Hoda's narrative here reveals several possibilities about her mother's status in the Sultan household. Had she been Muhammad Sultan's social or economic equal with a strong family of her own in Egypt, the details of her family and her relatives would have been made well known to him through the negotiations for marriage. He does not discover these details, however, until after she has become a member of his house intimate enough to help him put on his clothes, but not with a strong enough standing to deserve her own rooms in the compound as a wife of greater standing would have. And Hoda's father did have a wife, known lovingly to Hoda as Um El Kabira, or Mama, Big Mama, or the first wife, who did have her own apartments. But once Sultan Pasha learned of Iqbal's forced separation from her family, and the story was proven true, she did rise in status. Certainly, in the memory of her little girl Hoda, 
Already worried by the fear that her real mother had been a slave, Iqbal succeeded in erasing any traces of slavery or concubinage. Perhaps this work of erasure helped assuage Hoda's bad dreams about slavery. Perhaps these evasive silences protected the social position of Hoda's children. Okay, I'm going to uh, skip through this next part, but I would like to show you a picture. The exodus of Circassian refugees was a huge international cause célèbre in the 1870s. And I just wanted to give you an image of how these particularly young women were shown being made vulnerable to Muslim slave raiders. Um, this is a picture that is taken from the Times of London. It's called the Circassian Exodus, and it dates from February 7th, 1860. And often, this exodus and, and, and the, the, the difficulties and the troubles that these women and men found was labeled a middle passage by European journalists. And I just wanted to show you that because it's a very different kind of middle passage than the ones with which European and American writers would, of course, have been very um, familiar with. Okay. <coughs> okay. So I have focused now a little bit on the circumstances of Circassian slaves and how Circassian concubines and the sales of young women into slavery in the 1860s and the 1870s incited a great deal of attention, both, li both locally and internationally because of the tragedies of the refugee circumstances. There was also international pressure against the trade in African slaves that was made illegal in the Ottoman Empire and particularly in Egypt and Sudan in 1874. Slavery itself, however, was not outlawed, and the Sudanese slaves continued to make up significant parts of the domestic labor force, particularly in wealthy homes like Hoda Sha'arawi's. And in her remembrances of her childhood, Said Aga, who we have already met, an intimate guardian, figures prominently. There are other Sudanese slaves who, as well who wander through her past life, but almost all of them disappear as her memoirs narrate her adult life. Only a passing reference to Said Aga lets her readers know that he accompanied her into adulthood. Said Aga becomes, although he is a slave, becomes the figure who makes it most clear to Hoda what her status as a girl in Egyptian society is. It is Said Aga who, in one of the most famous instances of this iconic woman's life, tells the uh, Arabic teacher who she has asked to come and help her learn better formal Arabic, tells him to leave the house and take his books with him because what is she gonna become? She can't, she's never gonna become a lawyer. And Hoda remembered this, and this is a very famous, often translated passage from her memoirs. This incident affected me very deeply. Despair penetrated my heart and bitterness seized me to the point where I neglected my studies. I began to hate my femininity because it deprived me of the joys of studying or engaging in the sports that I loved so much, just like it would impede the freedom for which I so yearned. So he becomes, in this much quoted page, the embodiment of authority that kept women inferior and unfulfilled in Egyptian society. Then it seemed to Hoda that he ruled over everything. If Hoda and her brother committed any infraction, their nurses would complain to Said Aga, and he would make the siblings go into the yard, get branches from a tree, and bring them that so he could beat their palms and leave them crying. Then, Hoda writes, he would take the handkerchiefs out of our pockets and wipe away our tears. And he would say, you have each made restitution, but be aware of doing what you did again. If you do, the punishment would be worse. And then he would become a child like us, playing with them, running with them, chasing them. Hoda would forget his severity in the face of his playfulness, but her brother could not. As Hoda remembered, her brother would return to the house after such disciplining, and I quote now, climb up the stairs and hurry to my mother to tell her the news, complaining to her while overwhelmed with tears what the Aga had done, saying, that slave hit me. Said Aga was explained to the mother why the children had deserved punishment, and she would calm her son down, explaining he's only your guardian and he does it to keep you on the right track. It took Hoda a while to understand the constraints of Said Aga's life and the limits of his authority, but she remembered that her mother felt a very special sympathy for him, which she tried to explain. 
Said Aga was very proud to serve in the Shalawi household, and Iqbal understood the source of his pride. It was not only because this was a very important wealthy family, but also because Muhammad Sultan Pasha, the patriarch, had bought him when he was very small and had taken care of his upbringing, especially in having Said Aga educated in school. As Hoda described, Lala Said, that's another term for his office, was proud and disdainful, haughty in his behavior and very proud to be in our house. My mother was tender and sympathetic towards him because my father had bought him when he was very, very young. <clears throat> he loved my father to the point of worship. When he grew up, he directed that love toward us. My mother appreciated this love for my father and for us later. I also appreciated him and recognized the benefit of his raising us. It had a tremendous influence on me. Hoda also remembered what a well-run household this was and went on in her memoirs, moving from his authority, Said Aga's authority, to what a factory-like, tender, uh, efficient house the Sultan Pasha house was. And I read her saying, I recall, for example, our grand house with spacious apartments and vast parlor, how it used to teem with slaves girl and bondsmen. They were well-trained to work, sincere in performing their duties, sensitive to the responsibilities placed on their shoulders, respectful of their employers, careful with the things in their hands, and loving towards the children of their employers who were born in their hands. Each one would rise to his task in the best manner and would accompany us for better or for worse and would never reach his hand toward anything, no matter how costly, and would not covet a single thing but the pleasure of those who had authority over him. And we reciprocated this love with them and appreciated in them this loyalty. <clears throat> um, a different uh, scholar, Moja Kaf, plays close attention to Sharawi's wording here and how in Arabic certain nouns differ from those in popular English translations of her memoirs. And I don't know if you all have seen her memoirs, harem years, it's all over the place in women's studies and Middle East studies. It's like the book, the canonical book that we assign as a primary source. <clears throat> What is interesting, as Kaf notes, and that I find interesting as well, is that Hoda voiced how much she missed this economic order, and I quote now, as she wrote later, especially when I am confronted with some of the modern customs which make me long to return to the past and all, of its, and all that it contained of customs, courtesies, and matters, manners. So at this point in my research, I have found no details about the state of Said Aga's death, the date of his death, or whether or not he predeceased Hoda, who died in 1947. Therefore, I do not know whether he was still in her household when she dictated this nostalgia for the customs of the past. We may be able to assume from this caricature, the early caricature of 1936, that he was still in her employ. It's just interesting to me, we don't know, but here she was when she wrote this mourning the past, and yet she still had this slave companion right next to her in all of her powerful meetings with important nationalist uh, politicians. And her nostalgia is something that I find um, very significant as well. I'm going to um, summarize Hoda's experience with Said Aga by saying, yes, he was the big authority in her life, but it was also he who taught her how to be obedient. That when she was forced into a marriage at a very young age of about 14 or 15 to a much older cousin, it was Said Aga who taught her how to be humble and said so with tears in his eyes. And she learned to share a deep empathy for him. But it is not this man who gives to Hoda the sense of creativity um, um, and, and memory that I find most interesting about her connection to slavery. And I would like to go back into the household with her, the one that she looks back at so nostalgically, and look at the governesses, wet nurses, and maids. Okay? In a beautifully described tableau, Hoda described tender evenings of storytelling with these women. As for our night times, we used to spend most of them sitting in a little groups around a large lantern because electricity was not yet widely spread in Cairo. Our wet nurses would tell us their stories, how they were enslaved, what their countries of origin had been like, what the customs of their people were like until we grew sleepy and they would carry us to our beds. Hoda and her brother knew then that these slaves were not indigenous to Egypt, 
but they had been there so long, had been in the household so long, that the pain of separation from their own families and the memories of their own childhoods had become candlelit stories told and remembered like lullaby folk tales. The voices of the slaves in Hoda's childhood home are just whispers intended to put her to sleep, not meant to be remembered as important stories themselves. They were not part of the family lore. The bonds that tied the slaves to Hoda were indeed intimate, but had been forced. They were not stories that imparted a shared cultural past. While I marvel at the very human desire of Sudanese slaves to voice their stories while putting little it Hoda to bed, I do not read Hoda as attributing meaning to their narrative. <clears throat> as Moja Kaf has written, she sees in this residence Hoda almost censoring the slaves, censoring them um, competitively. And she writes, Hoda does not, for example, allow the recital of the servants' nightly life stories with which they fascinated the children to enter the narrative as a direct discourse, although her own manner of storytelling particularly her thrilling manner with dramatic incidents, surely owes much to the servants. She repeats only fragments of the servant's speech so that its charm cannot attract the reader, enough that the wet nurse's sentence is still ringing in her ear. Kaf is right. Hoda did learn to tell stories from the narrative gifts of her servants. She admits this when she describes how Sit of Zahra, the woman who sold rose water and perfume to the house, entertained them. So she, this woman comes and she sells flowers and perfume and she comes and the household invites her to come and they put her not at a place like this but at a central place where everyone can sort of sit around and listen to her. Because of how much we loved her, we encouraged her to stay as late as possible. We would spend the evening listening while she told in her golden voice her delightful stories. We sat around her, all of our eyes wide, our ears open. She went from story to story, and the salon on those evenings was filled with the entire household, forming a large circle that overflowed out of the door. And afterwards, we would fall into bed, dreaming the stories that she had told, entering the world of imagination. I think now it is because of this gifted woman that our imaginations had life. So this is Holda, again, not sharing those tales with her readers, but instead the sense of intoxication that these tales induced. Sitz of Zahra may have been a former slave or a servant. She certainly was a peddler. With the slaves who put Hoda to bed as a child, she taught Hoda how to tell stories, or more honestly, how to tell her own story. Hoda's memories of the slaves' voices set the stage for her own repressed childhood, a truly important story, but one in which the other's narratives are only a background. OK. I'm going to, how am I doing on time? Okay. All right. I'm going to turn now to Istanbul. I'm going to take a voyage of discovery to another great international city and look at the slaves of Halliday's bedtime. And um, we are getting towards the end because um, um, so Halliday has a much more. Um, yeah, you'll see. You'll tell me what you think. Halliday Adib Adivar also grew up in a household with a male servant who was a eunuch. And her presentation of him and what he meant to her shows the strong similarities she shared with Hoda. Sometimes in these memoirs, written in English, she wrote her memoirs in English in 1926, Halliday described her, her younger self in the third person as noticeable in this passage where the servant's body forms the boundaries of her life. Okay. Ali is the manservant who takes care of her. He is her Lala, that indispensable personage in every old Turkish household for which no English, no European equivalent can exist, for it arose from roots wholly foreign to them, wholly Oriental. The Lala was the natural outcome of the marked separation between the indoor and outdoor life of that day and world. Indoors was the delicate, intimate rule of women. Out of doors was the realm of men. They could play there their proper role of protector, and one felt happy and secure in their presence. As a child, and as a child only, one could share to the full the freedom of the two worlds, and one's Lala was one's natural companion into all the open air places of experience. Then too, he brings with him the memory into memory that je ne sais quoi of the old world service. I'm sorry, it's a fly. It's not the French. It's the fly. Um, <laughs> Then, too, he brings with him into memory that je ne sais quoi, the old world service, devotion, attachment, pride, possession even. 
with which the modern Turkish world has forgotten, but which made so much of the warmth and color of the old household life. So here too is that mourning for the past's courtesies based on old patterns of domestic labor. Halliday would have understood Hoda so well and why she would have seen, and she would have seen as natural Said Aga's place in Hoda's adult life. And like Hoda Sha'arawi, Halliday remembered as a child fearing that she too was somehow related to slaves, although that she does not perform the same obfuscation with her mother's past as Hoda does. But one could inherit in late Ottoman society a taint of slave status, not only through direct parentage, as Halliday describes here. And I hope you'll bear with me through this rather long quote. The accusation of having gypsy milk and mixed milk was a common one in those days. As my mother had been too delicate, father had hired wet nurses for me. It was believed that the milk a baby drinks affects its character, making it like the woman who drinks it. My first milk mother, as we call a foster mother, was an Albanian, and my summer moods were put down to her. Granny would say, now it is the milk of that cross Albanian which is working in you. The next was the wife of an onion seller, a supposed gypsy. Hence, anything in me different from a conventional Turkish child was her fault. For three months, fortunately, a good and beloved person had nursed me, and this gave the explanation of certain good traits. Whenever I was docile, gentle, or unselfish, it was attributed to my nevres badger. Badger is the appellation for a Negro nurse, and that is Halliday writing that, not me giving you that. A black slave of my granny's who had married in Istanbul. In spite of her black face, she had a milk white heart and had really nice manners. She had a respected position, and granny visited her often. And so that milk did something good for Halliday. But still, to be called related to a slave was an insult. And Halliday took it very personally. I'm not sure you can see it here, because by this time, she's an adult and has someone combing her hair very carefully. But she describes that she had very unruly hair when she was a child. Um, one of the horse grooms of her father teased her about it, but she refused to laugh. And then I quote, when the man saw that he could not tease me about my hair, he called me a little slave girl and swore that he had actually seen me bought from a slave dealer and actually knew the price that was paid for me, although he kept a mysterious silence on this point. Taking a step back from her childhood, Halliday contextualizes the situation and wrote, this was the identical nonsense for which every little girl was teased in Turkey in those days, yet every little girl minded it terribly, and some stupid ones, like me, believed it. So here we have this anxiety-producing epithet, this racial anxiousness, anxiety, coming, and this memory shared with all the former little Turkish girls of a certain age and class offers a profound insight, I think, into the ways in which enslavement entered the lexicon of gender and mothering and constructions of race. The insult here is about value. He actually knew the price that was paid for me, although he kept a mysterious silence on this point. And that Halliday did not consider it ridiculous, although her adult narrating self wishes that she had, speaks to the power of this epithet. And in the next memory, which literally comes in the next page, Halliday literally has to work her way through a sense of threat and terror when an elite eunuch of one-time slave, st slave status has some fun with her. Now this quote is, is, is in, uh, I, I was gonna print it out so everyone we could kind of share it, but I don't have it. So please be as patient as you've been, because um, it, it, it's entertaining. All right, there in father's room, in front of his writing table and sitting in his chair was a eunuch. As these people were familiar sights in the palace, the circumstance was not in itself strange, but this eunuch was different from the stately black men I was accustomed to. His face was a light milk and coffee color, his features were more regular than my own, his eyes were big and of the troubling kind, sad, humorous, and beautiful. His large handsome head was set on a crippled body with an enormous haunch on the back. I began walking around him in order to get a good view of the hunch, and then I stood and stared at him fascinated. I believe there was a curve of a smile. In fact, there were many smile curves in the corners of his mouth, but he kept them under control and returned my gaze seriously for a time. Then he sighed and rolled his eyes, his face taking on an extraordinary look of real suffering. Ah, oh, I am waiting for my father. Who is your father, I said. My father? He looked astonished. My father is Adib Bey, of course. Hoda replied, he is my father. 
Well, I'm talking of Adib Bey too, but he is my father, at least he was. I was his son, his firstborn, and you, a black foundling from the streets, came and bewitched both of us. I became crippled and black, and you, white, and took my place, and I was turned into the street. His face crumbled into lines, his voice sobbed, his eyes became full of tears, yet watched me furtively. I have never been torn between so many different sensations, belief in my own wicked witchery, fear lest I might be found out and sent into the streets and become a negress once more, pity for his miserable fate, and hatred toward him for making me feel all of this. I was trying hard to swallow the painful lump in my throat to hold back the tears that already stood in my lashes. I needed the strength of a dozen buffaloes to keep my mouth from trembling in ever so many directions. He crawled towards me, gazed at me, and tried to kiss me. Thou dear black witch, he said, his father entered the room. What tricks are you playing on my little girl, Aga? My father said, telling her not to steal the fathers of poor orphans as I, he answered. Father laughed and took me on his knees, but did not trouble to explain what seemed a tragic dilemma to me. I carried a misgiving in my heart about this until absurdity, its absurdity gradually made itself apparent to me. Racial identity was horrifyingly fluid to this little girl, Holiday, and the possibility of not being her father's white child terrifying to her. It is also interesting to see how this joke unites Adib Bey, Halide's father, and the Aga, clearly someone close to him, but never really identified in the memoirs. It makes them both laugh. And it is clear, too, though, that Halide gave a lot of thought to constructions of race in her childhood when writing as an adult in ways not imagined by her Egyptian counterpart, Hoda Shadawi. And I would like to make a note that Halide wrote these memoirs while she was an adjunct professor of Turkish at Columbia University in New York City, living in Harlem. Um, she had exiled herself from the Ataturk government. And so her vocabulary, her racial lexicon is English and perhaps not Turkish or a curious um, mixing of the two. And this is something that I need to explore further. Okay. Now, in her memoirs, Hoda Sharawi said that the slaves told stories, although she did not share those stories. Halliday does share some of the stories. And I'm just gonna leave you with, I'm, in conclusion, um, I wanna describe a growing relationship and growing um, mutual knowledge between Halliday, her sisters, and two little Ethiopian girls brought in through Yemen as gifts for the Halliday and her sister. As Halliday is described, the little girl bought for her sister was not an interesting creature, but Reshe, the one bought for me, was as pretty as an Abyssinian girl could be. And she wrote, as a rule, I believe colored people have sad dispositions, but when they arrive in a foreign country as slaves, hardly speaking a word of its language, they must feel sad indeed. Granny used to say that Turkish chickens and Abyssinian children are the most delicate creatures in the world, and I thought of it as I saw Reshe blinking at us and looking around with what seemed like fear, not just curiosity. Halide remembered very clearly Reshe's first night in the household and the image of her little sister Nailufer and Reshe staring at each other. Nailufer was frightened that Reshe would eat her. Are you sure she's not a cannibal? We were told a great many stories of cannibals and their characteristics, according to our information, were, two, were that they had two canine teeth sharper than other people's and a tail. That's Halliday. So Halliday looked over Reshe, who smiled strangely at her, and Halliday remembered it as more of a grimace than a smile. Still, she reassured her little sister that Reshe was not a cannibal. Years later, Halliday remembered when Reshe learned Turkish enough to talk, it was most interesting to hear her impressions of the first night in our room. Reshe had heard in Yemen that the white people of, Con of Istanbul were in the habit of eating Abyssinians. Halliday also remembered Reshe's beautiful dancing and the song she would sing when she was happy and the song she would sing when she was sad. Halliday loved it. I have never learned what this wonderful song meant, she wrote for by the time she learned Turkish, she had forgotten her own Abyssinian, but it had infinite pathos and longing. From it, I caught a glimpse of the misery of her past days before she was able to tell me about the way she had been stolen with her 
little brother from a wonderful Abyssinian forest and made to walk for months under the lash of slave dealers. There was that in her song, especially in the way she sang it, which made one guess the dreary suffering through the meaningless words. Whenever the oppression and weariness of life settled on my own heart too heavily, I used to ask her to come in my room and sing me that song. Though we cannot hear the song, Halliday hums a little of Resha's story, and then Halliday borrows the memory and the singer to help express her own feelings. In somewhat of a conclusion to this story, Halliday promised Resha she would grant her her heart's desire, which was to dress exactly as Halliday did. Halliday promised her, and I quote, that when I was grown up and married and had a house of my own, I would see that she should have the same dress as I did, as well as a servant and a nice room to herself. At the same time, I wrote her a liberating paper, worded exactly as Granny told me she had written the liberating papers for her slaves, so that Reche could no longer technically belong to me. I gave her this paper and told her to keep it in order to ensure her freedom in case I died and anyone else tried to sell her as if she was still a slave. Halliday did this, and although free, Reche remained in the household with Halliday. When Halliday married, Reche moved with her to her new home. As a young married woman with babies of her own, Halliday observed that Reche, and I quote again, had developed into a fine colored lady, dressed in the latest fashion, proud of the attention she attracted, and always taking care to wear a thick veil and gloves, which caused her to be taken for a white woman with a beautiful figure. They grew into adult women together, and Halliday kept her promise about the clothes. One wonders what Hoda would have thought. Even more, one wonders what Said Aga would have said. I leave you with one last image. At the end of, at the turn of the century, um, the Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan, um, let go many of the slaves of the imperial harem. And here they were photographed in a very well-known photograph in which they have removed their veils, they have no place to go, and sitting in front of them are the eunuchs who were in, their char were in charge of them and, and much of their upbringing in the palace. So I just wanted to leave this picture with you. Take a look at the picture. Just think about the relationships in the picture. What kind of conversations or stories these slaves told of each other and whether there's any kind of way of ever hearing what their experiences were. Thank you very much for listening.